I'm Dr. Jim Dole. I'm a professor emeritus at this university. In other words, I've been around here for a long time. Professor emeritus, by the way, if it doesn't mean anything to you, simply means that I'm a retired professor. But having been here for half a century, and that's literally true, I've been here for 50 years, uh, I know the system fairly well. I understand pretty well what mistakes students make. And my job this morning is to talk to you about the mistakes that you don't want to make. And in particular, what I want to talk to you about is your grade point average, or your GPA. This is extremely important because your GPA, whatever you graduate with, will follow you for the rest of your life. If, for example, you apply for a job, your GPA will probably be one of the first things your prospective employer will ask about. If you're applying for a graduate program, certainly your GPA will make a difference in whether you get accepted or not. On the other hand, if you're thinking about going into one of the medical professions, one of the health care professions, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, anything of that sort, your GPA can make all the difference in the world. If you have a high enough GPA, you'll be considered. If you don't, they'll simply not even look at the rest of your application. So it's really important that you have a high GPA. And what I want to do is talk about that GPA and several different aspects of it. For example, such things as how your GPA is calculated. It's a fairly straightforward sort of thing, but it's something you need to understand. I'm also going to talk about your three GPAs. That's right, you've got three. I'm going to talk about why improving your GPA gets more and more difficult as you progress towards your degree. This is just a mathematical fact, but you need to know that. I also want to talk about the fact that repeating a course can affect your GPA, not necessarily for the good. It depends on how you work at it. I'll explain that in a minute. And I'm also going to point out how failure to follow certain rules, in particular the rules for withdrawing from a class, can make a difference in your GPA, sometimes a profound but not welcome difference. Let me start by talking about how you calculate your GPA. I've given you the formula for it. You'll notice it's simply the number of units for a particular course times the grade points that you've earned for the letter grade that you earned in that course. You sum all of those for all of your classes and divide it by the sum of all of the units. But you first have to know that here at Northridge, there is a ability to have an A minus or a B minus or a C plus or any of those things with a plus or a minus after the letter grade, and they come up with different values. For example, if you get a minus after the letter grade, the point value will be three-tenths of a point less than the letter grade itself. If you have a plus after it, it's three-tenths of a point more than the letter grade itself. So you can see on this chart uh, the standard values for each of those letter grades. Let me just give you an example of one particular hypothetical student so we can calculate the GPA. You'll notice, for example, this particular student took Biology 106 and earned an A. The A is worth four points. The course itself is worth three units, so three times four gives you 12. We put that in the far right column. This person also took Biology 106 Lab, which is a one-unit course, but in that course he earned an A-. minus. An A- minus is worth 3.7. So you multiply the 3.7 times the one unit, you get 3.7 in the far right column. This person also completed chemistry 100, earned a C. A C is worth two points. Uh, the course itself is worth three units, so three times two gives you six in the far right column. Then you simply sum the far right column for 21.7 and divide that by the seven units. And this person then has a value, a GPA value of 3.1. Now, that's fairly straightforward and fairly easy to do, and there are actually some um, spreadsheets available online, or you can create your own that will allow you to do it. It doesn't take a lot of work. But what I want you to know also is that you have three GPAs, as I said, and each one is important. The first GPA is one we call the overall GPA, and this grade point average is based entirely upon all of the courses you've taken, whether they were taken here or at any other institution of higher learning. In other words, if you took courses at a community college and you put them on your record here, they will be included in this GPA as well as all the courses that you take at Cal State Northridge. The second GPA includes just those courses taken here at Northridge, no others, but all of the courses taken here for which you earned a letter grade will be included in your GPA here. 
The third GPA is the one that most people don't know anything about, but it's critical and, and can make a big difference, and that is what we call the upper division major GPA. And all that means is that you have a third GPA based entirely upon the courses that you have taken at the upper division level, meaning 300 or above, and are in the major, in the biology major. So you've got three GPAs. But what you also need to know is that in order to graduate, you have to have a 2.0 GPA in all three of them. Not just one. Every single one of those GPAs requires a 2.0 or better, hopefully a whole lot better, in order to graduate. Okay, what I'd like to do at this point is to demonstrate what happens uh, to a GPA, a person's GPA, when he or she takes four unit class and earns an A in that class. And I'm going to deal with the person starting when he's a freshman. At this point, let's say he has 10 units earned. Uh, since he has a 3.0, that means he's earned 30 points, has 10 units, which is where he, where he gets the 3.0. But let's say he earned four units of A, and what does that do to his GPA? It changes it from a 3.0 to a 3.28. That's a significant change. That's a very big change and a very welcome change. But what I want you to see is what happens to that same individual when he's a junior. What effect does that same four-unit course have? Let's assume now that he's starting his junior year with 60 units with a 3.0. That means he has 180 points, 60 units earned, gives him the 3.0. Now, let's assume this person takes a four-unit class and earns an A. What does that do to his GPA? And the answer is it raises it from a 3.0 to a 3.06. Not a very big jump. In other words, even though he took one four-unit class in each case, earned an A in both of them, in one case, when he was a freshman, it made a big difference. As a junior, it made a piddling little difference, not much of a difference at all. And the reason for that is simple mathematics. It's simply that when you are a freshman and you add, let's say, four units to all the units you've already completed, that four units is a big portion of the units you have. If you add four units to the 10 that you already have, that four of the 14 is going to be a large number, large proportion, and it will affect your GPA calculations accordingly. On the other hand, when you're a junior and you add four units to the 60 units you already have, now you have 64 units. The 4 is a very small, much smaller proportion of the 64. And as a consequence, it has a much smaller effect on your GPA. Let me show you a table that will illustrate this. Uh, again, I've taken, created this table assuming the student has a 3.0. And I've taken it from a freshman year when he has, let's say, 10 units, all the way up to when that person is near graduation with 120 units. And you'll notice, for example, as we've seen that as a freshman, that four-unit class with A's got him from a 3.0 to a 3.28. As a junior, from a 3.0 to a 3.06. As a graduating senior, that same four units would move him from a 3.0 to a 3.03, a very tiny fraction of a change. Now, just to show you uh, how this works, again, I'm going to choose to illustrate it with 12 units of courses worth A's. And you can see that it makes a big difference for the freshman going from a 3.0 to a 3.54, but a very small difference for a graduating senior from a 3.0 to a 3.09. In other words, the longer you're here and the more units you accumulate, the harder it is to change your GPA. And I mention this because I've actually had students come to me uh, and tell me that uh, they are a changed person. For example, it's, the story usually goes something like this. Uh, I've I'm starting my junior year. I've not done very well. I've maybe made a C average, uh, but I really want to make it to medical school. I'm going to work really hard in the next two years. I'm going to earn all A's, and I'm going to make it to medical school. I'm going to get my GPA up high enough that I can do that. Well, the point of this is that that's not really possible. Let me explain. First of all, you would probably understand that the probability of a student who was a straight C student or a C average student for two years is not suddenly likely to become a straight A student. But even if we assume that he did become a straight A student, his GPA would go from a 2.0 to a 3.0, which is a nice increase. That's certainly worthy, but it's not enough to get into medical school. Now, 
You need to also know something about repeating classes because this too can influence your grade point average if uh, you do some things incorrectly. Uh, university rules permit you to repeat up to 16 units of classwork for what is commonly called grade forgiveness. But don't misunderstand this. This does not mean that your earlier grade is somehow painted out and a new grade is placed on in place of it. That doesn't happen. What happens is that both grades remain on your record, but the newest grade, presumably the higher grade, is the one used in calculating your GPA. That's important to know. Now, you can do that for 16 units, but you have to understand also that you only get a grade forgiveness if you repeat the same course at the same institution and only for the first 16 units. Now, you can repeat courses beyond the 16 units, but if you do, and you can only go to 28, then that from after the 16 units, what happens is that both of the grades are included in your calculations of your GPA. For example, uh, if you repeated a class in which you earned an F and got a C, both of those grades will be included in calculating your GPA, and that's the equivalent of earning a D. Or if you had an F the first time and then you repeated it and got an A, both of those grades would be included in your calculation of a GPA, and that's the equivalent of earning a C. Okay, the point is you have to be really careful about this. The other point that you need to understand is this, that if you repeat a class or try to repeat a class, you may find yourself in a situation where you just simply can't get into the class. For example, if you're repeating a class, the university rules require that you not enroll in the class until four days before the class begins. And if you know anything at all about what happens at this university, most of the classes are going to be full at that point. So the chances of getting into a class that you're repeating are very tiny. The best thing you might do is try to take the class in the summer because then there's less competition. But in any case, it's tough to get into a class when you're repeating it. So what's the moral of all this that I'm saying? It basically boils down to this, and that is when you enroll in a class, take it seriously. Don't assume, as some do, that, oh, I can goof around here, and if I have to, I'll repeat it. No, you don't want to ever repeat a class if you can avoid it. If you have no choice, of course you repeat it. But try never to get in that situation. Earn the best grade you can the first time through. If your aim is to graduate with a high GPA, and I hope that's the case, then the way to do it is to start with a high GPA, earn it now, and keep it there. You can't play catch up. It just simply doesn't work. One other fact that you need to understand is that withdrawing from a class, if it's done improperly, can greatly affect your GPA. I've actually had students who've made some serious mistakes, and I want you not to make those mistakes. But you'll notice that the withdrawal policy at this university is such that if you withdraw within the first three weeks of the semester, nothing happens. It's also even possible to withdraw from a class later in the semester, provided you have a valid reason and that you can convince the associate dean that your reason is valid. If you simply walk away from a class, as some students do, and as a consequence, they wind up on their record with a grade of WU, which means an unofficial withdrawal. A WU counts as though it were an F. In other words, if you have a WU on there, it gives you no point value, but counts as whatever number of units you should have earned. And that will affect your GPA negatively. I even had a student who walked away not from just one class, but from a whole semester of classes. He came to me just a few months ago and was asking me, what do I do at this point? And I looked at his record, saw 16 units of WU, or from the point of view of the GPA, 16 units of F. And he wanted to know, what does he do? And the only thing I could tell him is, you've dug yourself into one heck of a big hole, and the only way out is to work really hard in the future, earn high grades in all the rest of the classes, and gradually get your GPA up to a, an acceptable level. It was down below 2.0 at that point. Getting it up to a 2.0 will be a struggle, but it can be done. But please, don't get yourself in that situation. 
And I highly recommend that you always, if you have to withdraw from a class, do it officially. Don't walk away. If you have any other questions, give me a call. I'm, at, I'm available at the Advisement Center, or better yet, stop by and talk to me.